Well, good evening to you from Canberra, Australia, and hello wherever you may be watching. I'm Peter Jennings. I'm the Executive Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our Indo-Pacific Leaders Dialogue webinar on the theme of Withstanding Terror in Afghanistan. It's our pleasure to be hosting a conversation with Afghanistan's Minister for Foreign Affairs, His Excellency Mohammed Hanif Atmar. With the United States and other countries having withdrawn military forces from Afghanistan, what are the prospects for maintaining stability in the country? What international support does Kabul need? And will it arrive in time to make a practical difference? What is the position of China, Pakistan, Iran, and other countries with stakes in Afghanistan's situation? What is the current and likely situation on the ground in Afghanistan? And what support can Australia provide? There are many issues to discuss. Shortly, we'll hear from Minister Atma, who will be making an opening statement, and then we'll move into a discussion between myself, the Minister, and Professor Bill Maley from the Australian National University. Then I'll be happy to take questions from you, our online audience. So please get your written questions ready as we speak, and then I'll put some to the Minister. All in all, we will close at 5.45 Eastern Australian Standard Time, or in about 45 minutes. And now to introduce our special guest. His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Hanif Atma is the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Minister Atma is one of Afghanistan's most senior leaders of the post-democrat, uh, of the post-Taliban democratic era. He has served in several key government posts, including National Security Advisor, Minister of Interior, Minister of Education, and Minister of Rural Rehabilitation and Development. In May of 2020, Atmar was designated as Minister for Foreign Affairs, his fifth ministerial posting. Mr. Atmar has played an active role in Afghanistan's modern political life. In 2010, he founded the Rights and Justice Political Party and ran an energetic campaign uh, for the presidency in the 2019 presidential elections before withdrawing from that final race in the interests of focusing on the Afghan peace process. During the 1990s, Mr. Atmar was an aid worker in Afghanistan, holding senior positions with various national and international non-governmental organizations. Mr. Atmar holds a master's degree in public policy and post-war development studies from the University of York in the UK. And he has published several academic works on the role of humanitarian aid in Afghanistan. Joining us also this evening is Professor William Maley. Bill is Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University, where he was Professor of Diplomacy from 2003 to 2021. Bill is a member of the Order of Australia, a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, and a Fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Bill is the author of many works, but in particular for our purposes tonight, uh, Rescuing Afghanistan, 2006, What is a Refugee, 2016, Transition in Afghanistan, Hope, Despair and the Limits of State Building, 2018, the Afghanistan Wars 2021, and most recently, Diplomacy, Communication and Peace, Selected Essays, also published this year. Minister Atmar, we're looking forward to your opening statement, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Bismillah rahman rahim Salaam alaikum. Good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are. Thank you so much, Mr. Jennings, uh, for invitation and organizing this event. It's a pleasure and honor to be uh, uh, together at this event with Professor Mali. I am uh, one of his dedicated readers. Uh, his work in Afghanistan is very well uh, known. Uh, with this, let me also take this opportunity to thank Australian people and government, and especially pay my tribute uh, to the memories of those brave Australian boys and girls who sacrificed 
uh, uh, their lives in, in defending Afghanistan and the free world. Uh, we are equally appreciative of uh, the uh, Australian taxpayers' generosity uh, that has advanced uh, uh, both reconstruction and, and, and development work uh, in our country. Uh, with those uh, appreciation and tributes, let me uh, quickly look at uh, three uh, main topics uh, about which I wanted to focus my introductory remarks uh, and then um, engage in a discussion uh, with all of you. And I'm grateful uh, for uh, the interest that our participants uh, today have shown in Afghanistan and in our situation. Uh, my first topic is the current situation and uh, its humanitarian and human rights consequences. And second is uh, the um, fighters and the, the, the threat that they pose not only to Afghanistan, but also to the region and beyond. Uh, and finally, what the government of Afghanistan is planning to do together with our international partners. So I'll be very quick with, with all of these topics. First, uh, on, on the security situation, uh, we are probably experiencing the most massive, brutal and opportunistic military campaign, uh, a campaign of violence and terror by the Taliban ever in the history of our country. Uh, this uh, wave started in mid-April after the announcement of the withdrawal of foreign troops uh, from our country and already has had devastating impact on, on, on our country. It has literally disrupted and eroded uh, security, uh, 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 rule of law, uh, and, and public service delivery in over half of our country. Uh, uh, the loss of critical terrain and also uh, uh, cross-border uh, 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 trade uh, points uh, have had significant impact on humanitarian situation uh, and then trade and uh, uh, market functioning in, in the country. Uh, we've lost already since mid-April over 6,000 people, uh, 4,000 of them of our brave national security forces and, and over 2,000 uh, from the uh, civilians. Uh, the number of wounded would uh, uh, would come to over 15,000 over the past couple of months. Again, this is the highest figure we have ever experienced over the past two decades. The humanitarian crisis is uh, overwhelming with uh, um, over 18 million of our people now facing hunger and in need of immediate humanitarian assistance because of the devastating impact of the recent wave of uh, terror and violence, uh, the, the combined effects of uh, um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the drought uh, have been uh, exacerbated by by the wave of the recent wave of uh, violence. Uh, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of displaced people and millions of people who are ready to leave their hometowns and may even cross the uh, border into our neighboring countries. Uh, and this situation is worsening because of the Taliban uh, um, um, violence directed at our urban centers. Uh, over 10 of our cities are now under direct attacks. Um, the, the human rights situation is, is similarly uh, staggering uh, in terms of the patterns of deliberate violence and abuse by the Taliban and their affiliate uh, foreign fighters. I mean, you, you must have uh, seen the recent statement by 
the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and, and also statements from uh, the Independent Commission of Human Rights of Afghanistan. So uh, uh, um, the international bodies now have consensus that this is probably one of the worst humanitarian and human rights uh, crisis that we are facing. Now, this brings me to my second point, that Taliban in this campaign of terror are not alone. They are assisted by their foreign affiliates. And these foreign fighters, uh, who are a key threat, not only to Afghanistan, but the region and international community, uh, come from various categories of transnational networks of terror. Uh, I mean, category one would be those who have a global focus, such as Al-Qaeda and Daesh. Uh, category two are more focused on the region, uh, including uh, the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the ETIM of China, uh, the LAT, Lashkar Taiba of Pakistan, uh, TTP of Pakistan, so you name it. These transnational networks of terror uh, uh, have a different agenda. Their agenda is not entirely compatible with the Taliban. The Taliban may have uh, a domestic focus, but these foreign fighters do not. So by extension, the Taliban are actually assisting them in pursuit of their regional and uh, global uh, a terror campaign. So uh, we've been engaging our neighbors and, and the region, as well as our international partners from China to Russia to Central Asia, India, and uh, to our European and North American friends. All of them have been warned that these foreign fighters uh, have a, a different agenda. They had it in the past, they have it now, and there is no reason to believe that they will not have it in the future. So it's a real threat that we have to deal with. Uh, this brings me to what is it that the government of Afghanistan is doing under the current circumstances while we have such a difficult security situation uh, because of uh, the lack of a transition process. Uh, and what is it that we would expect from our international partners? So I'll, I'll be very brief on this, and I may come back to this uh, in our Q&A uh, session. Uh, we will be pursuing two lines of efforts. The government of Afghanistan is focused on peace and reconciliation on one hand, and security and counterterrorism uh, on the other. On peace and reconciliation, I must uh, uh, reiterate the government's firm policy position uh, that we are committed to peace. We know that the Taliban uh, were deceptive, have been deceptive. They did not honor their obligations as part of the Doha Peace Agreement. They ignored the international and regional consensus embodied in the UN Security Council resolution and in statements of, of many international bodies uh, for peace, reconciliation, cessation of hostilities. Uh, they uh, were opportunistic and they asked for the release of their prisoners. The government of Afghanistan, in good faith, released those prisoners, over 6,000 of them. Uh, and yet these prisoners have taken an active part in, in the campaign that we are seeing today in this campaign of terror. So despite all of those, we are committed and we will work with uh, the Doha process. Uh, as we speak, there are uh, um, meetings of our regional and international partners taking place in Doha to lend their support to the ongoing uh, um, uh, 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 peace negotiations. But honestly, uh, we expect more from our regional and international partners uh, to achieve uh, uh, the goal of a immediate prevention of attacks on cities and b accelerating the negotiation process uh, to reach a political settlement and comprehensive ceasefire. Now, uh, if it's our strong belief 
that if our regional and international uh, partners address the Taliban with one voice and firmly, these objectives are achievable. So we are hoping that uh, uh, such a common position will be achieved uh, during the, the next UN Security Council meeting and the ongoing uh, consultation in uh, 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 in Doha. Finally, is our security and counterterrorism issue. Um, many of you may agree with me that Afghans have been fighting not just for Afghanistan, but also on behalf of all of the region and the international community. As I said, it has never been a civil war. It has always been uh, proxy wars combined with transnational uh, networks of terror, uh, with symbiotic relationships with uh, drugs and uh, transnational criminal uh, networks. So with this, Afghanistan is firmly uh, determined uh, to continue to defend Afghanistan and defend our uh, regional and international partners. We have produced a new security plan. We understand that we have a challenging situation because of the, um, uh, the decision uh, for withdrawal of troops and, and the um, uh, withdrawal of especially close air support assets. So uh, this plan is prioritizing geographically. This plan is looking at rebuilding our forces while we are defending our uh, critically important areas. For both peace and reconciliation and our security and counterterrorism uh, lines of effort, we will continue to see uh, engagement with our international partners, including Australia, and, and seek their support in this process. So I will leave it at this and then come back to any aspect of this that may be of interest to you and our participants today. Thank you, Mr. Jennings. Thank you, uh, uh, Minister Atmar. And, and uh, uh, sadly, you paint a, um, a very distressing picture of the uh, the difficult situation that uh, Afghanistan finds itself in at the moment. Uh, are you able to share with us your um, judgment about the, the tactics that the Taliban and associated um, uh, entities are engaged in right now in Afghanistan? Uh, for example, I understand that a priority has been to on, on the part of the Taliban has been to close off border crossings and to destroy roads and other forms of access into the country. What's your estimate of the strategy which is informing how the Taliban is operating and, and where is this likely to progress uh, over the, the coming uh, next few months? Um. Well, first of all, their goal uh, is victory through a military uh, strategy. Uh, this is clear. They, uh, many of our international partners told us that the Taliban, uh, the Taliban's only objective is the departure of foreign troops from Afghanistan. And this was uh, what they had the so-called jihad for. Uh, we said we don't believe it, but if you are ready to believe them and, and you are encouraging us to continue to negotiate with them, fine. So we will uh, give it the benefit of a doubt and, and move ahead. And unfortunately, we were all deceived and, and taken by surprise uh, that Taliban demonstrated their real objective, strategic objective, which is to conquer Afghanistan by force and use foreign fighters in an opportunistic manner because these foreign fighters were not able to, to join them so um, actively uh, because of uh, the, um, uh, the capabilities, the counter-terrorism capabilities that existed in our country with the US and NATO and the resolute support uh, uh, partners. 
So now, uh, firstly, they looked at our rural areas where um, our forces were extremely um, dependent on close air support because we could not. Our objective was to defend the entire country and not allow any spot in our country to become a safe haven for international terrorism. So in those remote areas, we had to keep our forces, our bases, and then they would be supplied logistically, but also in combat operations by air. Now, with the immediate drawdown of air assets and the, the diminishing capabilities, uh, most of these bases were overrun, unfortunately, and we didn't have the, the time and the resources to bring them back to the main population centers. So that was number one. Number two, they tried to uh, capture most of the, uh, the border crossings so that the government of Afghanistan uh, is deprived of its legitimate uh, public revenue uh, to finance uh, the, um, well, they have a revenue from drugs and from uh, um, uh, um, transnational criminal uh, 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 endeavors that, that they undertake. Uh, we, we have to rely on uh, A, our own uh, revenue, national and B, uh, international assistance. So now they have turned to the cities. Over the past three weeks, we see their focus on urban areas. Again, they promised to the United States, Russia, China, members of UN Security Council that they would not attack cities, but they are attacking cities. And it's um, uh, uh, disappointing that we don't see a significant international voice here that attacking cities is not only uh, a violation of the promises and the obligations contained in the Doha Peace Agreement, but it will create a massive humanitarian situation, which would destabilize not only Afghanistan, but at the region. So uh, uh, the Taliban have made their intentions quite clear to all of us. It's our time now to make our intentions clear that we will stand uh, for human rights, we will stand for uh, our common security, and we will stand for our st uh, shared stability and, and prosperity. Thank you, Minister Atma. Let me hand over to Bill Maley for a question. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, great pleasure to be able to speak once again, uh, Excellency. And I'd like to ask uh, a question that follows up from the mention that you made of the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, on Friday last week, there was a discussion of Afghanistan at the Security Council. Uh, I was wondering if you could outline what specific measures you would like to see the Security Council take at this particular point to uh, address the situation as it's evolving. And perhaps as a footnote to that, I note that yesterday the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and Administrator of the UN Development Program, Helen Clark, raised the question of why Twitter in social media was providing a platform for the propaganda of the Taliban, which is being used to try to sap the morale of people within the Afghan population. Uh, and I'd be interested to know if you have any reflections on the responsibilities that those kind of companies, private companies, might have to play in this kind of situation as well. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Nice to see you after such a long time. Uh, uh, when we last met, I was wearing a, a totally black beard, but now it's uh, um, uh, quite grey at this. So good to see you again, Professor, and thank you for the excellent work that you are doing um, uh, together with, with other uh, prominent scholars for Afghanistan. Um, uh, sir, we requested uh, uh, the United Nations Security Council to hold a special session on Afghanistan. 
I talked to my counterpart, uh, uh, Minister Jay Shankar of India, uh, uh, whose country is the um, uh, 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 the current chair of the UN Security Council. And we said to them in one word, we want you to implement your own resolution 2513. Uh, and that is a good enough resolution. If the Security Council believes in it, then they should undertake it. Um, so, but, but more specifically, given the current situation, we outlined the two specific objectives. Uh, one, immediate uh, prevention of attacks on cities, violation of human rights and international humanitarian law, and two, acceleration of the peace talks uh, reaching a political settlement and permanent uh, ceasefire. And to achieve these two goals, uh, we requested the Security Council uh, to have unity. Uh, the unity of the Security Council will be key to, to the success of its resolution and, and uh, strategies. Um, so they uh, prefer to have a briefing first on Friday, it, uh, and then we participated. And I'm grateful to to all of the speakers uh, there. They made extremely good points. I mean, you you saw the consensus there. Everybody condemned the level of violence. Everybody emphasized uh, peaceful resolution and. A political settlement, everybody called for uh, respect for human rights and international humanitarian law. So we are fine with all of those calls. But those calls would not have any change on the ground in the behavior of the Taliban unless backed up by some real political, uh, economic, uh, maybe even law enforcement measures. Uh, so uh, our request is, please first make it clear to the Taliban that it is time for them to honor their obligations and it's time absolutely necessary for them to pay heed to the international consensus in this respect. And if the answer is no from the Taliban, then there's a wide range of instruments available uh, to the UN Security Council uh, and the international community from uh, sanctions, not only not lifting the existing sanctions, but adding new sanctions. Uh, uh, um, professor, uh, uh, a significant part of the Taliban political and military leadership is now visible. They, uh, they are known uh, where they, they live and, and what they do. So they will be certainly responsive to, to those sanctions. Um, uh, second is also uh, for the United Nations Security Council to work with Pakistan and demand serious action from Pakistan to disrupt and dismantle not only the sanctuaries uh, from which these attacks and uh, campaign is taking place, but also the logistics and the supply line uh, to the war machine of the Taliban. That needs to be achieved. If the world is to see stability in this region and success in counterterrorism, uh, the sanctuaries issue and the issue of logistics and supplies will have to be addressed seriously. Finally, it is our expectation that there must be some serious measures in terms of human rights compliance uh, uh, by the Taliban. Uh, and this may come to uh, an issue of uh, uh, use of force. Now, we have the force, but we have certain uh, 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 constraints in terms of our capabilities. So the international community, uh, for the sake of peace and stability in the region and the global community, uh, may need uh, and, and surely need to work with us uh, to work for our common security goals. 
Minister, I would like to follow up on that comment of yours uh, just made by asking the question. So, so what can a country like Australia do uh, that you would find useful to assist you in, in this fight? Um, as you very kindly began by, by thanking our forces for, for their involvement in Afghanistan over many years, well now, uh, regrettably to some, uh, our forces have been withdrawn. But in terms of the immediate crisis that you're facing, what, what can a country like Australia do that, that is useful to Afghanistan at this moment? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would very much like, uh, again, um, uh, um, um, to uh, express the heartfelt gratitude of the Afghan government and the Afghan people to our Australian friends. Uh, that's the first thing. Please accept uh, gratitude from uh, a grateful nation, a grateful partner. Second, uh, please continue your excellent work and partnership with us. I understand that the forces are withdrawn, but continuation of the partnership is essential to achieving our common interests common national security interests. These interests are common uh, to not only to our region, but also to Australia, uh, uh, North America, and our European friends. Uh, so we must understand that while the Afghans are grateful for the enormous uh, generosity of the nations around the world, but we must understand that we are in this together for our common interests. Uh, and that must necessitate uh, the continuation of, of the partnership. More specifically, I would look at the two lines of efforts that the government of Afghanistan is pursuing, the, the, the peace and reconciliation and, and the security uh, and counterterrorism. On peace and reconciliation, Australia is well positioned to work with our regional partners uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region and, and all of those partners of, of, of that framework of cooperation are engaged in Afghanistan. So it may be an excellent uh, framework of cooperation to, to look at Afghanistan. Um, and, and work with the UN Security Council, with UN uh, international uh, human rights bodies, uh, with, with uh, all of our partners in the region to achieve those uh, two specific uh, objectives, uh, uh, prevention of attacks and uh, political settlement. Uh, now, I, I've had a number of excellent conversations with Honourable uh, 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 Minister uh, uh, Payne over the coming, uh, over the past couple of uh, months, and when we've exchanged views on 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 what Australia can do politically uh, to work with the United States, NATO, Europe, and our regional partners uh, in terms of uh, achieving those specific uh, uh, peace-related uh, goals. Uh, when it comes to security. Uh, um, obviously, we are grateful for continued financing uh, and uh, uh, political support for our national security forces. Uh, I wouldn't go into details of a defense strategy here, but I did uh, raise ideas of uh, technologies that can be used uh, to uh, make up for the loss of air assets. Uh, because of the uh, drawdown of troops, and Australia could be uh, an excellent partner in this. Uh, of course, we want uh, uh, Australian diplomatic presence in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we uh, are uh, fully supportive and are committed to do whatever we can to provide uh, security. Of course, it's, it's a community of uh, diplomats uh, living there together uh, and the government of Afghanistan has 
uh, uh, by, by um, international convention a responsibility to, to provide such security. Finally, uh, we will continue to uh, request uh, Australia's engagement in terms of humanitarian and uh, development assistance. I am so grateful that uh, the Honourable Minister uh, stressed the fact that uh, there will be continued humanitarian assistance given our dire situation at the moment with half of our country in need of uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, and also not to forget development assistance and particularly education of our young people. Australia has been extremely good with this. Uh, uh, and, um, we still believe that uh, educational opportunities for Afghans will make a big difference and, and strengthen our capabilities for both peace and counter-terrorism. Thanks, Minister. I'll go to Bill for one more question, and then I'll put some questions that have come through from our audience. Uh, Bill? Uh, thanks. Minister, could I ask you a question about the uh, negotiations in Doha? We've seen a report that the US negotiator is returning to uh, Qatar, uh, but a lot of uh, criticisms have been voiced of his diplomacy, including to the effect that he's neither feared by the Taliban nor trusted by Afghans. Uh, and there have also been recent proposals for uh, third party mediation to be uh, attempted either by a nominee of the Security Council, an idea floated by two former special representatives of the Secretary General in Afghanistan, or most recently uh, by the uh, possibility of a neutral state contributing uh, a mediator. Do you think there's any uh, value in this or are stronger measures required in the current situation? Uh, I think uh, um, uh, both. Both will be required, essentially. We first need uh, facilitation and mediation. Uh, uh, and frankly speaking, uh, our preferences uh, for the United States to do that with support from Qatar, who is hosting uh, the, uh, the talks. And we've made it clear to both the United Nations and Qatar that the government of Afghanistan favors facilitation slash mediation uh, in, in that kind of uh, structure uh, and, and combination. Uh, our problem, Professor, is that uh, we've been never left alone to make our own decisions uh, because of the enormous interests that the region and international community, state and non-state actors take in Afghanistan. So we need to provide a forum that is trusted by these actors, especially our regional partners. So uh, that's number one, and we would like uh, uh, that to happen. Already Qataris are providing facilitation, and I had a good conversation with the Secretary General's uh, personal envoy, who is a very good friend and very well respected diplomat in Afghanistan, that the UN needs to take a greater role in terms of facilitation and uh, mediation. Um, it, it's sad that there isn't any country in our region that could be trusted by everybody. It, it, it's such a problematic situation. So best thing is that the regional cooperation is also uh, structured uh, uh, multilaterally in a manner uh, that countries feel comfortable uh, and attend. Uh, over the past uh, uh, couple of days uh, and an another day to come, uh, there are three meetings taking place in Doha rather than one. Uh, 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 and all three on the same subject. Uh, one is regional partners, another is international and regional, and the third one is uh, the Troika Moscow format. The reason that these are three meetings because some of these countries do not want to attend if the other country is present there. But they would all have to attend when the United Nations, uh, uh, United Nations is 
uh, is hosting the meeting, convening the meeting, because they do so uh, uh, at General Assembly and UN Security Council and many other forms. So uh, uh, our first challenge is that we need to deconflict the regional cooperation so that they can come and help us with resolution of our conflict. Uh, and that is uh, something for a small country like us uh, terribly difficult to achieve. So it would be my appeal uh, to the United Nations, UN Security Council, to A, provide that serious engagement in terms of facilitation and mediation, and B, provide a multilateral setting where all of these countries can come and uh, uh, express their views, and then finally reach consensus uh, in terms of uh, uh, counterterrorism and peace and security in Afghanistan. Minister, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that we have just a few minutes left, so very quickly I want to put to you some questions that have come from our audience. Uh, a, a question that has been put by a number of people is to ask, is there any realistic prospect of negotiation with the Taliban at this stage, given their uh, military position on the ground? What's your reaction to that? Muted. Uh, you're muted, uh, Minister. I'm sorry. Um, uh, my answer was yes and no. Uh, in terms of the prospect of success. And no, if things do not change uh, as they are now. If things change uh, with us and with the regional and our international partners, uh, uh, there's a strong yes that I believe in. Um, so if uh, our region, our international partners with one voice, one unified message, uh, a counter the Taliban uh, campaign of terror, uh, we will have a serious prospect for peace. The Taliban will respond positively if there is one voice from the region and the international community. Second, if that voice is credible enough uh, that if there is a failure, that the international community will confront uh, the Taliban, uh, then the prospect is absolutely there. It, it is uh, feasible to expect uh, progress in terms of uh, peace in the coming weeks. Thanks, Minister. Another question that a, a number of uh, watchers have put goes to uh, China's interests and motivations here. Uh, there was certainly uh, extensive media coverage of the Chinese foreign minister meeting the uh, Taliban political leader uh, in Tianjin uh, just a few days ago. What's your judgment about China's uh, position uh, in this situation? Well, China has a legitimate interest and there are serious threats uh, to Chinese security. Uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, specifically EGIM, the East Turkestan so-called Islamic movement. Uh, well, but ETIM is not alone. It is hosted and aided uh, by the Taliban, uh, and it's part of uh, the foreign network of Daesh in Afghanistan. Uh, and it is already positioned itself in northeastern Afghanistan, especially in Badakhshan, which borders China. So the threat is, has been serious and China cannot ignore it. But China will have to become a, a central part of uh, our regional and international effort for both security and counterterrorism and peace and reconciliation. China uh, has been engaged. Uh, as we speak, the Chinese uh, special envoy is in, in Doha attending meetings. Uh, but we would very much like to see more forceful 
uh, uh, and uh, effective engagement from China, Russia, India, uh, 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 as well as Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, uh, in addition to the United States, uh, Europe, Australia, and Japan, to have a serious impact on, um, on, on uh, both security situation and peace and reconciliation. Uh, Minister Atma, the last question I'll put from our audience goes to uh, the situation we've seen over uh, a few weeks where uh, the Afghanistan National Security Forces in, in some areas uh, uh, seem to have very quickly been dispirited by the pace of Taliban gains uh, and, and have not put up much resistance. Are you able to comment on what we're actually seeing on the ground? How has this um, situation emerged uh, in terms of the Afghan National Security Forces? Um, well, I will be very honest uh, with you, my own people and uh, our international partners. Um, uh, there have been occasions or mostly that we were so proud of uh, and have been proud of our national security forces, their bravery, their valor, their um, um, sacrifices, um, absolutely remarkable. Uh, but there have been uh, performances uh, in certain areas that we are not so proud of. Um, this, may, this has, very little to do with the courage of our national security forces. It is more related to the structures of support and especially close air support, the absence of which actually uh, led uh, to uh, the diminishing capability of our forces uh, to put up resistance. Now, uh, uh, those situations and the factors that sustain that poor performance will have to be addressed seriously, first and foremost by the leadership of our government, and second also through assistance of our international partners. Uh, I believe uh, you see the, the bravery of them in Kandahar as we speak, uh, in uh, Herat, uh, in uh, mazar -e sharif uh, in Ghazni, there, uh, I mean, I was speaking to some of them last night and to even our very uh, elderly uh, <laughs> leaders who have joined the forces uh, with, with such bravery and dedication that is uh, absolutely making every Afghan proud. Uh, but, we, but we will have to address the weaknesses where uh, um, um, such qualities of our forces were not well uh, demonstrated. Well, Minister, speaking for myself, uh, as, as a person who was uh, a, a civilian in our defence establishment, working very closely uh, with Afghanistan over many years, I, I can speak to the great respect and admiration that our own forces had for the Afghans that they worked with uh, in, in Aruzgan province uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, we've come so quickly to the end of our time, Minister. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for uh, you taking the time to speak to us in what I know will be a, an immensely busy period. I want to wish you courage and wisdom in the job that you're doing uh, and to pass on the, the great best wishes of so many people in Australia who support you and support the government of Afghanistan. And can I thank you once again for taking the time to talk to us this evening? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, let me thank Professor Mali. And it was such a pleasure and honor uh, to be with you on, on this event and, and hopefully to see you back in Afghanistan one day. Thank you all the very best. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister. Minister. And to our audience, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, look for the next ASPE event uh, to join us uh, virtually and hopefully uh, in person at some stage in the future.